Hello and welcome everyone once again to BYOT Global Youth Climate Summit 2021. My name is Roshi Shamim and I welcome you all to the fireside chat for this summit. As the frequency and intensity of climate change events in countries around the world increases, it is today's youth who will face the worst effects. The UNAP projects that by 2050, the Cuban population will reach 9.6 billion and require three plants worth of resources to survive. Experts fear that many of the species of animals and plants we share the planet with will become extinct by the time we reach the end of the century. To avert this crisis and to ensure the flourishing and survival of humanity, we must act now. I therefore welcome you all to our fireside chat on managing the well-being of both ecosystems and human beings. To all our delegates attending the fireside chat, please submit your questions in the Q&A box. For this fireside chat, I would like to welcome Sir David King, who is the Emeritus Professor of Chemistry at University of Cambridge. He is also the Founder and Chair for Centre for Climate Repair at University of Cambridge. Sir David Dick King is Emeritus Professor of Chemistry, University of Cambridge, as I have mentioned, is also an affiliate partner to Systemic Limited and Senior Strategy Advisor to the President of Rwanda. He has traveled widely to persuade all countries to take action on climate change. He initiated an in-depth risk analysis approach to climate change, working with the governments of China and India in particular, and initiated a collaborative program now known as Mission Innovation to create a 23 billion pounds research and develop international exercise which involves 22 countries and the EC to deliver all technologies needed to complete the transition into a fossil fuel-free world economy. As government chief scientific advisor, he raised the need for governments to act on climate change and was instrumental in creating the British one million pound energy technologies institute. He was also elected fellow of the Royal Society in 1991, foreign fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2022 and knighted in 2003. To moderate the session, Sir David King, we have Ijaz Ahmed, who is the founder and president of Bangladesh Youth Leadership Center. Mr. Ijaz Ahmed is a recipient of Ashoka Fellowship, Eisenhower Fellowship, and Harvard Kennedy School's Rising Star Award. He has worked in several World Bank, UNDP, and Bangladesh government projects pertaining to banking and sustainable environmental management. Mr. Ijaz Ahmed has also served as honorary fellow in the School of Management at the University of St. Andrews between 2015 and 2018. I would now like to invite Mr. Ijaz Ahmed to begin the fireside chat with Sir David King. Once again, I request all of you to submit your questions to us in the Q&A box. Over to you, Mr. Ahmed. Thank you so much, uh, Roshni. Sir David, wonderful to see you. How are you? Very well, thank you. I hope you're well too. We are well, Sir David, and we are so delighted to have you with us. Uh, we started the summit with an inspiring session. It's a two-day event. We'll be uh, talking about climate change. We'll be talking about uh, how young people can lead the fight against climate change, helping them develop a vision uh, and then develop some action plans. But I think at the heart of this, it's critical to understand the science underlying climate change. So let me begin by asking you, uh, would you expand on the science uh, that is underlying the current climate crisis? So the first thing, uh, EJ, is to say that we, we need to understand the role of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Uh, initially, about 1820, it was thought that the temperature of the earth was 20 degrees hotter, uh, sorry, colder, than the temperature of the moon because we have an atmosphere that captures the heat. But actually it turned out most of the gases in the atmosphere, oxygen and nitrogen, do not capture the heat. It's these very low quantity gases that we call greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide is one of the important greenhouse gases. If you burn fossil fuels, this is buried carbon that has been buried many, many millions of years ago, you are putting back into the atmosphere more carbon dioxide than we've had in the past. And so what was predicted by even 1900 was that if we keep burning fossil fuels, if we keep removing fossil, uh, trees, the global temperature must rise. And as the global temperature rises, 
we must see rising sea levels. When you warm water up, it expands, and so the sea level goes up. And more than that, if you warm the atmosphere, ice on land, such as the Antarctic, such as the Himalayas, will of course melt, and that ice then runs eventually into the sea down through rivers. And so sea level rise is the other major challenge. Temperature rise, changing weather pattern, and also sea level rise. Now, the, the big surprise is that we, the climate science community, have been trying to predict how this will develop through this century in different behavior terms. Different behavior means, can we stop using fossil fuels? Can we learn to create energy by other means? And we felt that this was virtually something we could do in time. That is no longer understood because actually we had underestimated the rate at which ice is already being lost from places on land. And in particular, the Arctic, the Antarctic, and the Himalayas. In the Arctic region, if I can just talk about that for a few minutes, in the Arctic region, for many hundreds of thousands of years, the whole region has been covered by ice. And of course, the ice is not so thick that you can't occasionally break it and see the sea below. But over the last 50 years in particular, the ice has been melting and melting more and more rapidly over the Arctic Sea. When that happens, it means that during the Arctic summer, the Arctic Sea, which is blue, soaks up most of the sunshine that impacts on it. And so the Arctic Sea warms up rapidly. The ice that was covering it, which is white, reflected the heat of way back into space. So the, reg the region around the North Pole is now heating up far more rapidly than the rest of the planet because of this one factor. The big risk there is that sitting in the Arctic Sea is Greenland. When ice on sea melts, sea level doesn't rise. But when ice on land melts, the sea level does rise. When all of the ice on Greenland has melted, sea levels around the world will have risen by 25 feet. And of course, that's going to mean that all of our major cities and many countries will be suffering from complete loss of the ability to live in those cities. We are now predicting that by mid-century, just 30 years from now, and this is a prediction that we can make with some certainty, I'm afraid, that the, the, the region of the world that will be hit hardest is Southeast Asia. And the reason is twofold. One is the rising sea levels, but the second is this is a region which is hit by tsunamis, hit by hurricanes more often than other parts of the world. Hurricanes, that great vortex going vertically up from the earth, pick up their energy from the ocean themselves. So when a hurricane has passed over the ocean, the water behind the hurricane is much colder because it has sucked up the energy from the ocean. What this means is that places like the Philippines have now experienced the most intense hurricanes ever observed. And so what you have is seawater being pushed inland every time. And of course, Bangladesh is one part of the world where this is known to be a problem. Uh, year on year. But we are now predicting that the country of Vietnam will essentially be flooded once a year. Now, when I say the country, 90% of the land mass of Vietnam, two thirds of Bangladesh. The city of Calcutta will not be livable. And I'm talking about 30 years time, 2050. The, city, the, the cities in the region most at risk are uh, Calcutta, but, it, but in um, Indonesia, Jakarta is not going to be a livable city going forward in time, even in a shorter period than 30 years. The government of Indonesia is now planning to move the capital to a higher, uh, to higher land. The city of Jakarta has grown in the last 25 years. It's a big, modern, bustling city. That's a massive investment, 30 million people living there. Imagine 
the cost to the people of Indonesia to move that city to higher ground. But worse than this, in the region of Southeast Asia, we are predicting maybe 200 million, maybe 300 million people having to find somewhere else to live. Now, all of this is unless, and the unless is unless we all take urgent action to manage these risks. And that's really the main message I want to get across. We have to take urgent action to manage these risks. And when I say we, every one of us living on this planet. Well, thank you so much for, for, uh, for uh, giving us an overview of the challenges. It's, it's, it's a very uh, grim uh, future that we are looking at. And we're just looking at 30 years uh, down the line. What I'm hearing from you is, uh, getting to net zero emission is critical. You know, all of this has to be done, but it's not sufficient unless we can uh, get uh, to, you know, below 350 uh, parts per million um, to pre-industrial levels, uh, the future of humanity is at stake. And particularly in many of the countries in Southeast Asia and the city where I am talking to you from Dhaka, uh, this is a, a big concern for us. So one, uh, one uh, follow-on question I have for you is, I know you founded the Center for Climate Repair at Cambridge. Are you, uh, are you developing any strategies for addressing uh, this crisis? Uh, not just focusing on zero emissions, but also on restoring or repairing the climate. Correct. There's little point in setting out the challenge if I don't also set out the means of meeting the challenge. And the Center for Climate Repair at Cambridge, which is fully up and running, but it's only two years old, is, is developing this strategy in some detail. And we're working with partners around the world. This is a global problem. Everyone has to partner up and work together. I'm going to give you the simple principles that underline the Center for Climate Repair. The, the principles are easy to spell out. To deliver them is very much more challenging. So the first principle is deep and rapid emissions reduction. We as a planetary society cannot manage unless we stop using fossil fuels, unless we stop removing forests, we cannot manage going forward in time. These challenges I've spelled out, I'm just having a very short discussion with you now. I could talk all day about the challenges for every bit of the, the world. First, deep and rapid emissions reduction. Supposing we stabilize the emissions where they are today. That's already a dream because we're emitting uh, so many tons of greenhouse gases. It's 51 billion tons a year. Everything I spelled out for you would still happen because there's something that happens very slowly the ice, for example, that, that 25 meter sea level rise will take maybe a hundred years to happen. So this will just go on happening and the map of the world will be changed whether or not it's by 30 years time or a hundred years time because of that big rise in sea level. London will not be capable of surviving anything like uh, uh, even a three meter sea level rise is a very big challenge for us. So the second thing is we have to get the greenhouse gas level in the atmosphere down from the present level to the pre-industrial level. And the present level, pre-industrial 275 parts per million total greenhouse gas expressed as carbon dioxide equivalent, but let's call it carbon dioxide. And today we're at 509. We have been comfortable on the planet at 275. We double that. It's like you go to bed, you're cold, you put a blanket on yourself, you keep the heat in your body. But if you put a second blanket on, you will definitely get hotter. And that's where we're going now. We're increasing the capture of, of energy by increasing the greenhouse gases. And we're nearly approaching doubling the greenhouse gas level. We have to take the stuff back out of the atmosphere. And we're looking at 
mechanisms that we can use to reduce this at maybe 30 or 40 billion tons a year of greenhouse gases, which means to take us back to close to pre-industrial levels will take us to the end of the century. And we will just have to work year after year on this project. But the third level of operation that is required, and I'm saying these three levels have a focus for everybody. The third is refreeze the Arctic, refreeze the Himalayas, refreeze the Antarctic, because if these go on melting, then I, I can use the English expression, frankly, we're sunk, right? It's, it's going to be very, very difficult for us to manage the kind of sea level rise that uh, we're talking about. Here in Europe, which countries are most at risk? Holland, number one. Britain, number two. We are an island nation. We are surrounded by water. And as sea levels rise, when there are storms at sea, our rivers are flooding at the same time as our coastlines are under attack. Holland, well, that's a country that's sitting very, very close to sea level. And for centuries, they've been managing flood risk. So we, we, we're all in this boat together and we all need to work on these challenges. We have, uh, we have uh, uh, delegates from different countries uh, joining us uh, in this fireside chat. Let me just read a couple of comments that came in. Uh, Daya Sekar from, uh, from Indonesia is saying, uh, Jakarta, Jakarta sinking is one of youth's major concerns in the country. And we uh, in Indonesia need to act toward it. Thank you for the elaboration, Sir David. Um, another comment from someone in South Asia. My hometown is located beside the Bay of Bengal and a few days ago, I lost my home. I can understand the effect of climate change in our life. Um, and a couple of questions. Uh, Khaibar Atai is asking, when we are talking about the developing world, they need so much to invest on their natural resources to meet their developing goals. So what will be the alternatives to these countries if they don't use from their natural resources. I think he's referring to fossil fuel uh, in developing countries. That's one. And let me just ask uh, another question. Hadeul Islam Mashuk is asking, what is the role of the Western government with the oil and gas company they have? They emit at least 60% of greenhouse gas in the world, and they do not want to take any reduction steps. So one is around the Western governments uh, relating to the oil and gas industry and the other is about the developing world where they need to use natural resources for the development goals how should they be thinking about it it is a very very important question so let me take first can i take the developed world first it is our responsibility precisely <clears throat> to stop using all fossil fuels as quickly as possible <clears throat> Coal, oil, and gas are all leading to this problem that we're in, and it can only get worse if we keep using it. We have built our economies since that pre-industrial time by burning coal. We in Britain started the whole process. The Industrial Revolution began here in Britain. And you could point the finger of blame at us, but don't forget, the whole world has benefited from burning those fossil fuels to create a, a bigger global middle class, etc. But we now understand what these fossil fuels are doing. We are planning in detail to defossilize our economy here in Europe. We're quite advanced. So in Britain, whereas uh, we used to produce all of our electricity by burning coal, a tiny amount from hydropower, we are now producing much more than half of our electricity from renewable sources. But here's a little surprise to feed into you. I've been pushing this for 20 years, and I was pushing against governments saying, but what about our, our economy? And I was saying, well, let's see if we can't build an economy around renewables. The renewable sector is today our biggest new employer. It's employing half a million people. The, the renewable sector is the biggest contributor to our economy because we can stop importing oil 
oil, gas, and coal from other parts of the world, right? So if we're put taking the natural resources by which I mean the wind and the solar energy, the sun, out of the sky and turning that into electricity, we're putting British people to work to do that, uh, and it, it is better for our economy. I'm an advisor to the country of Rwanda, so I just move over to de developing countries. And when I began uh, working with the president, Rwanda, it, its economy was growing at 8% a year, uh, a very, very vibrant economy. And at, at the same time, it meant that because there was a bigger demand for electricity, they were burning more and more coal, and they were also burning oil brought in from overseas to make electricity. In Rwanda, we are now using solar energy, and that is putting Rwandans to work to make the energy product. It, it, it means we're not importing oil, gas, and coal from overseas nearly as much. We have attracted Volkswagen to build electric vehicles in Rwanda so that the vehicles can be charged off the electricity grid produced by non-fossil fuel yeah. sources. These are all doing the economy a lot of good because many more Rwandans are working. For example, solar panels on rooftops. It means you have many companies now in Rwanda just maintaining the solar panel uh, electricity distribution systems. So I think, I think the answer to both those questions is for all of the world, we have to see fossil fuels as Last century's me mechanism of producing electricity, it is not fit for purpose in the 21st century. There, there is, of course, a resistance coming from those countries that produce a lot of coal, oil, and gas. Uh, and I believe there's only one way to do this, and that is to look at the alternatives, which are renewable energy sources. Um, in discussions in South Africa, for example, I was asked by the trade union movement, what are you going to say to our coal miners? And what I said was, let's give them training in managing solar panels. You have a desert, the Kalahari Desert, build solar panels across the Kalahari Desert and put those same coal miners to work on maintaining the panels and uh, putting them up. Coal mining is one of the filthiest jobs in the world. Putting solar panels up in the desert, quite the opposite, right? So, so let's not also forget, many lives are being shortened by living in cities around the world that are suffering from pollution, from burning coal, oil, and gas. It is not good for any of us. Let's move into a clean world in which we abandon all of that. The biggest challenge, is from countries such as India, which are so heavily dependent on their own coal that they're mining. But that challenge has to be met by government intervention to see that those same people are retrained to work in the clean energy sector. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Sir David. Um, one more question from a delegate, Mahmoud Shaheed. He's asking, will taking action make our lives better or safer now or will it only make a difference for future generations and i think this is a question that many young people have mm -hmm. that uh, why should i make the sacrifices is it going to affect my life or is it a matter of future generations so what's the timeline if someone you know most of our delegates uh, in this summit would be in their early 20s late teens what kind of a change can they expect to see in their lifetime I think, I think that what we will see will be apparent within a few years. And so let me just say, it. what we human beings do over the next four to five years will determine the future of humanity for the next 2000 years, right? So that, who are the people most at risk today is those young people you've referred to, the people in your audience today. They are the people most at risk. So there's no safe future in simply going, for example, into the fossil fuel world. The fossil fuel world is yesterday's technology. It will not exist in the future. Get into the clean energy technologies. You will breathe clean air. It'll be much better for you. But if you don't want to get into the energy technologies, there are so many other areas that you can work in, right? So I, I think the main point I want to make is 
just as when I'm addressing the financial sector to the banks, I say, do not invest in new oil interventions. Do not invest in coal mines. Do not invest in gas because you will not get money back for your investment. These are what we call stranded assets. You invest in a future that isn't there. And it means those coal mines will simply be shut down before they have produced the coal they were meant to produce. What we need to do is invest in a future that is a true future for the 21st century. And I do not feel that we should abandon the notion that there will be many, many more jobs in those alternative areas than there will be in the fossil fuel futures. Thank you. Um, you spoke about the next four to five years. Um, can you uh, give us an indication of how young people can be envisioning their career or you know, any uh, actions they can take to make progress on this front? Of course, you know, part of the work has to be done at the national level, at the government level, uh, but what can young people do? What role can they play uh, to make progress on both the emission front as well as on the repair front? So I'm going to give two very different answers. My first answer is young people are already having an amazing influence in the political sphere. Uh, you guys, I'm sure, have all heard of one young woman, Greta Tunbury, who has had such an impact in the world. One young woman making a de determined effort. She just sat outside the parliament in, uh, in Stockholm all on her own, and she managed to get attention. She didn't go to school, and now she is a lead, leading voice for action on climate change. She has got public attention to the whole issue. So I'm saying that young people determined to understand that their future is at stake here, need to get impatient with the older people. Need to say, what are you leaving us? It's a, it's a simple principle of life. Leave the planet in at least as good a state for the next generations as you found it for yourself. And we, the older community of the world, are now failing young people. And it's for young people to explain the responsibility to the older people, in particular, those who are in responsible positions. And I mean here politicians, industry leaders, etc. It's not, it's not your actions alone in terms of your work, but it's your actions in terms of your voice. Young people getting together and really ex expressing how they feel. And EJ, you are an example of that. So I, I think that we need to hear the voices of young people in the media, on television and so on. But the second thing, so now I take a different line. First, what influence can you bear on that generation that is making decisions today that threaten your future? And the second line is to say, and then examine your own career. And examine your career, not in terms of what you think when you look around you, that looks attractive, why don't you do that? But bear in mind that your choice of career is a choice for life probably. And so just think in 30 years time, will this career still be around or will I be going into one of those careers that will simply shut down because they are not viable in the 21st century? So you, you do need to make choices that are based on your own understanding of what a viable career looks like in the future. I know, uh, so David, you've spoken about new technologies in many of your uh, lectures and talks. Can you give us an indication of the sectors that you see as emerging where young people can explore career opportunities? So I've, I've already mentioned electric vehicles when I was talking about Rwanda. And if, if you look at the emergence of electric vehicles, there, every new aspect of these vehicles is a creative opportunity and an opportunity for wealth creation, right? So 
if if you if you want to get involved in the the electric vehicle business where do they get their energy from when they're traveling from a to b when they're traveling a long distance they, you you need to think about how i can provide electricity providers to recharge their batteries from wherever they are it's it's a matter of being inventive to meet the demands that are already being set in place. Um, I think around the world, there are different levels of electric vehicles, but uh, here in Britain, I don't believe you will be able to purchase an electric vehicle in less than 10 years time in Britain. I think every uh, car will be electric. And then that creates a whole set of other demands. Uh, so for example, just maintenance of electric vehicles. Uh, so if you were thinking, and I, I guess your audience may not be thinking of working in a garage where you fix cars, just remember, if you have an ability with electricity, that has an enormous future in it. Um, I, I think the, the focus needs to be on how do you use wind? Uh, how, do you, how do you use that as an energy source? If you are near the sea, how do you use the energy of the ocean, the energy of the sea, to provide energy for whatever you want to do, right? So uh, you, any farming of energy from the local area that you live in is a potential resource and a potential job. So I think the, the main message I want to get across to, to young people is reinvent the future. Each level of invention that you make is not only a career opportunity, it's a wealth creation opportunity. You create a business that is fit for purpose in the future. The, the old guys, people as old as myself, tend to be stuck in their way. They're not going to reinvent the future. It's up to the young people, right? That's critically important. It's the same with the older companies. Guess what? The companies that are in the best position to manage this transition to post-fossil fuel world are the oil companies. They have a vast amount of money. They could easily do it. Will they do it? No, nope. they're not doing it because they only see the world through their blinkered eyes as a fossil fuel energy world. They don't understand that there are alternatives emerging. So we old guys get a bit stuck in our ways. Uh, it really is, and I'm making a, a very important point here, up to you guys to work out a safe future by developing the whole series of technologies or methodologies required in a post-fossil fuel world. We are, we are working or living in this world, in a, and I'm now talking more about the West than the developing world, in a very wasteful way. We, we waste resources, we throw things away. Uh, I don't know if you guys buy a new, lap, a, a new laptop every two years or a new mobile phone every year, but that, that is the super consumer society we live in. What about recycling these so that they are recycled and put back into the, the, the world through the marketplace? So you can recycle goods to put them back in. What I believe we learn from nature is there is no waste in nature. If you walk into a forest, if a tree has fallen down, that tree becomes the source of mi minerals, the source of uh, all of the systems required for new trees, new plants to grow. It's all recycled. We have to learn to recycle. So another big focus for opportunities is the recycling industries emerging now. And these opportunities are really massive. It's, it's not as if I'm just talking about a, a minor set of industries. Thank you. Um, I will take a few more questions from the delegates and we have to wrap up in five minutes. So I'll also ask okay. you to be your I'll try and be quick. <laughs> with, uh, with the questions. Uh, we have a delegate uh, from Zambia, Thelma Sumyanga, asking, so as a young woman from Zambia, how can I participate in improving or tackling climate change 
when the government might not let me do so. And this question is around, you know, if authority in your country is not enthusiastic about it, how much can you as a young person really do uh, in societies where maybe uh, dissent is not looked at very positively? So that's uh, one question. And the second question um, is, uh, Esha Aruj, you're talking about, uh, about electric uh, vehicles. But what about developing countries? What is the most cost effective uh, technology uh, available in developing countries for minimizing the effects of climate change? And I think, uh, you know, when we are talking about uh, the climate crisis, we're talking about clean energy, solar energy, great, but electric vehicles not widely available in developing countries. We're talking about changing our diet, but uh, the diet uh, in the UK or in the US. Uh, you have wide variety of plant-based diets, but in developing countries like Bangladesh, you know, uh, your, your sort of, you know, eggs are a major source of your protein. So just getting rid of uh, animal protein uh, is a bigger challenge. So how, how do you see the, the adjustments that are required uh, yeah. for developed countries and developing countries? That's a hard balance to, uh, to find. And with that, I would also uh, invite you to add your uh, reflections on how optimistic uh, are you or what are you trying to, hoping to achieve uh, through COP26, uh, which is later on happening in your country. Thank you. Okay, there's three important questions there, which I'm going to take, not in the same order that you gave them to me. First of all, I want to deal with uh, developing countries against the way developed countries are, are making the transition. Very, very simple answer, leapfrog. Do not go through the same development process that we went through. That would be a real waste of a future because these technologies are not viable in the 21st century. So I think in part, this is a question of imitating the countries that are doing the transition best. So for example, I think China, has more electric vehicles than any other country in the world as a proportion of vehicles on their roads. Ch China's making this transition very quickly. But there's another point that, where I've been in China fairly recently, electric bicycle, right? So you, you'll see in China, a vast number of electric bicycles now on the roads. So people are now not using their cars so much as they're using bicycles because the electric bike uses much less energy. And it's also worth keeping quite fit because although it's electric, you're still cycling. I mean, frankly, I've got an electric bike, but that's because I'm an older guy. It, the, the, the point I'm making here is leapfrog into whatever attractive technologies are emerging. And many of these technologies are actually much cheaper than the traditional technologies that we've been talking about. Um, the, the emergence of, uh, of these new technologies requires not just imitation, but it also requires being inventive so that it's relevant to your own society, your own geography, uh, and manage that, uh, that process. Um, I, I think I, I couldn't emphasize this enough. When I was in Rwanda, that was the single thing everyone got a little tired of me saying, no, don't imitate the mistakes we made in the West. We're having to give up all of these things now and make the transition. Your economy is growing at 8% a year. Just dive straight into the, the future. Don't wait for it. Don't imitate us and then have to transition later. Now, the most difficult question that I was asked is from Zambia. I know Zambia very well, and my wife spent many years working there uh, while I was in Rwanda. Um, I think that is a very difficult question. I would never want to put anyone in a situation where they end up in jail or under threat from the authorities. That's a very challenging position to end up in. So you know your country best. You know what it's safe to do and what it isn't safe to do. All I'm saying is you need to operate within 
the country you're in without endangering yourself. Now I say that, but I, and this is why I'm pausing on this answer, because I was brought up in South Africa, uh, where I was born, bred and educated in, in a country that was run by an apartheid regime. And that apartheid regime did not like the position I was taking, right? Which was uh, not just opposing apartheid, but making sure that I had most of my friends from the black community, etc. And eventually I was kicked out of the country I was born in. I had never lived anywhere else until I was kicked out. So I've, I've been through that pain and it was a frightening process being taken in by the secret services. So it's, it's, and do I regret having done what I did in South Africa? Absolutely not. So there are occasions when we feel we have to put ourselves in a difficult situation. Now, having said all that, can I try and answer your question about optimism facing COP26? First of all, the biggest reason for optimism that I have is that the United States now has a president who understands the challenge of climate change. He has appointed John Kerry, who I know well from my negotiating time in Paris. And John Kerry understands the aspects of climate change, I would say, as well as I do. He's right on the ball. And that team he is leading is really outstanding. The first time in the world that we've had a leadership position from the United States on climate change. Now, imagine that. The, the world's great power is now backing us for action on climate change. And what is the second world great power? I'm going to say it's China. Xi Jinping has announced net zero emissions by 2060 at the latest. This week, the next five-year plan is out. I don't know if it's been published, but I have seen it. And that next five-year plan is the first five-year plan to deliver the change away from use of fossil fuels. And it's really seriously uh, uh, produced. The planning committee had to reset their plan on instruction from Xi Jinping, right? So they had to recharge the whole thing. It's, the planning committee apparently told the president, this will cost you 2.2% of GDP every year to make the transition. And the president wrote back and said, never refer to that as a cost. It's an investment in our future. So my my promising aspect of COP26 is when these two big superpowers are committed to action on climate change, I believe it can happen. And that's wonderful. what I'm working on. And that's what I hope we can all push towards. Thank you, Sir David. And uh, thank you for everything that you're doing to make the world a better place for all of us. Uh, we, are, we are at the end of our, uh, of our fireside chat. And I want to uh, uh, appreciate uh, you giving us your valuable time.